Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Peep and creep. Peep and creep. Wet one today. Tuesday. Busy day. Nothing but busy days now. Could expand the surgery. Don't want to. Had an interesting. Uh, we are we are so well run. My surgery. The other dentists are referring patients to us that they can't take on. And you might think, and it's possible that they think that they're getting one up on us by telling patients that there's a surgery there that's so unpopular that you can get an appointment at a minute's notice, whereas they're booked up three months. But as I've discussed before, that is very uh, old style thinking. That is very like, you know, Look at how important I am. You can't get an appointment to see me for ages. That's all, that's all, that's surgeons thinking that is. And you know the only difference between a surgeon and God is that God knows he's God. So, we had these patients come and see us and uh, we're giving them very quickly, we're giving them a, an opinion. This guy had had a tooth root treated it's one of these very uh, suspicious, very straight root treatments. And uh, I've had a, two in, in the last week. One was a lady who had a tooth root treated endodontically in the US. And uh, well, had had uh, trouble from it recently. And when you took an x-ray, this tooth, the, the roots just look too straight. They're just like, literally like, two straight roots, it was a lower left six. And then this other guy, I think was also a lower left six. And uh, he's uh, two very, very straight root treatments. Not at all, no curve at all. Now I'm not, you know, and against the background on the X-ray of a root, which is obviously not so completely straight. You wouldn't see a completely straight root like that. They've got, they've always got some bend on them, you know, even if it's a gentle curve. And they tend to increase towards the tip, whereas these ones are obviously, um, I think, mechanically created, these, uh, these root canals. And so they look uh, pretty impressive on x-ray, apart from the fact that they're suspiciously straight. And they seem to be extremely well obturated. But... Uh, white van you see you catch a white van at a point where he thinks that you can go into someone's front garden to get round him and he'll just carry on driving so yeah and anyway he's uh, he's uh, got a some radio lucency around the mesial root on this lower molar so and he's very uh, into micromanagement you know he's like Asking tons of questions, which is fine. I don't mind people asking tons of questions, but he can't. But he asked tons of questions because he can't quite get his head around the answer. But the answer was, first of all, he needs to decide whether he wants to try and save the tooth, and he doesn't know about that. But he knows very, very forcefully that he doesn't want a gap. So there's a bloke who knows exactly what he doesn't want, but doesn't know what he does want. So. I said to him, if you don't want a gap, then your first option is to decide whether you want to try and save the tooth. And if you want to try and save it, then you have to go to a specialist endodontist, because I'm not basically touching it with a barge pole. Because if I try and re-root fill it and it's already perforated or uh, it doesn't work, and you know, and I've charged you in the meantime 600 quid, which is nothing for a molar re-root treatment, you know, I mean, it's like a half or a third of of what he would be charged anywhere else, um, but he's still going to—he's still going to take me to the general dental council, isn't he? Or he's, he'll be straight in touch with Dental Law Partnership and let them do their uh, their uh, shakedown of my indemnity society using him. 
and start complaining that I haven't made a note of what route, what, irri what irrigation fluid I used and therefore they're entitled to £10,000. So, <clears throat> if he decides that he doesn't want to keep the route filling and he doesn't want to go and see a specialist endodontist, then um, the tooth needs to come out. If the tooth needs to come out, then he's going to have to have a gap for at least three months while it heals up. Unless he goes to see an implantologist who tells him he can do an immediately loaded implant, you know. And we're talking about, bearing in mind, we're talking about a lower sexy, you know. This, you'd think it was his upper central incisor the fuss was making him at. So I said, you're going to have to have a gap for three to six months. Three months if you want a bridge and six months if you want an implant. And then obviously you can decide what you want to do with a bridge being adequate and not cosmetically quite so brilliant. And we'll do a Maryland type bridge. And, uh, or an implant uh, having to wait for the bone. But, and being twice as much, you know, and, and probably taking another three months uh, to uh, obviously wait for the bone to integrate before we put the crown on it. So, um, you know, and he, I, he asked me to explain this to him two or three times. And I don't accept that it's complicated and, uh, as a lay person. And he was trying to memorise it all. And I said to him, look, I'm going to uh, write this all down for you. So you don't need to memorise it all. And then he's like, oh, yeah, well, when will that be? Will that be this afternoon? Will that be tomorrow? And I'm thinking, as soon as you get out of the effing surgery, you know, the, the quicker you let me sit down and write it all down, the quicker you'll get it in the email. And sure enough, about half an hour after he left, you know, we, we sent him. Our quotes are long. They're 12, 16, 17 pages sometimes. Got all the information in them about extractions, all the information in them about bridges, all the information in them about implants, all the information in them about endodontics. That's a long old quote, you know, when you put in absolutely everything that you think a patient might want to know. Bearing in mind he's a diligent patient and he will want to know everything. And, um... And then, uh, and then as soon as he gets the quote, and, and I'm sure of far before he, he could have had a chance to have read it and inwardly digested it, he's on the phone saying that he'd like the name and phone number of the endodontist so that he can have a chat with them and make a decision about what. So then, you know, <laughs> so I sent him a name and a phone number of a couple of endodontists and uh, and his x-ray, which they're going to want to see, which he doesn't know yet, but I know that they'll want to see that. And so he's going to be back on the phone to me again, isn't he, saying, oh, yeah, they've asked if they can see the x-ray, can you send me my x-ray, etc. So I preempted the third call by sending him the x-ray, and then now he's going to go, I mean, fair enough. I mean, this bloke does, he's doing a lot of due diligence on this tooth, which is fair enough. It's his tooth, and he's got every right to do it. But I just don't, uh, I'm not at all impressed and I'd like to know what it is about these mechanical reaming systems. Well, I know what it is. <laughs> <They're> just, <laughs> you know, it's just like, <laughs> instead of excavating a dinosaur with a, with, a, with a paintbrush and a trowel, it's like excavating it with a, with a JCB. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, what could possibly go wrong with a with a sensitive, delicate, time-consuming, fiddly procedure like a root treatment if you mechanise it? Uh, at the end of the day, to um, increase your profits, let's not beat about the bush. To do them quicker. I mean, I'm sure the patients appreciate them being. But in fact, this woman who went to America, she said it took like seven hours to root fill this too. I mean, <laughs> it wouldn't take me seven hours to root fill a tooth if I just sat there and stared at it. Yeah, no, I don't know. So anyway, she ended up losing the tooth. And he ended up, uh, he's ended up probably, he'll ring up the endodontist and say, uh, you know, my dentist has suggested I might come and see you. 
uh, because I've got a root treatment that's failed and it might need to have it redone. And they'll say, yeah, that's fine. We can book you an appointment, 90 quid, to have a look at it. Have you got the x-ray? And uh, yeah, that, uh, you know, it'd be about um, 1,800 quid to have a go. At which point he'll then ring me, ring me back and say, take, take the blue thing out. I'm rather hoping he doesn't ring me back and say, can you have a go? Because although I would be tempted to have a go, if it was my wife or someone in the family who could be trusted to accept that I'm doing, acting in good faith and doing the best job possible, and that I do possess the skill of a reasonably, in fact, above average, averagely skilled endodontist, but I'm not on the specialist list, which means that I'm not, you know, I'm not bulletproof. As far as some random bloke who walks in and, and I've only ever seen once. And as you know, if you listen to this channel, I've been caught out that way recently. So I'm not about to get caught out that way again. Yeah. So uh, Lou, my nurse, is off. She's having a minor op. So Ellie, who's my receptionist, is nursing for me and doing a very good job. And we're both doing reception. So this is uh, communications. Did a podcast last week on communications, how to set them up so you can set the set it up so that your main phone also rings your mobile phone. So we've got two VoIP phones which are plugged into the internet, which will ring anywhere in the in the building, and that's my mobile phone. So between the three phones, we can always take a phone call. Unless we're literally halfway through pulling a tooth out, in which case I would say don't worry, but uh, or doing a crown prep or something. But normally, uh, you know, one of us is near a phone, and anyone can pick up a phone, and all the computers have got the appointment book and notes on there. So for the most part, and also uh, people tend to uh, make appointments by clicking on a link either in a text or. Uh, in an email they've been sent so we can sit down we get a Google spreadsheet comes up with people who want appointments telling us when they want the appointment so that's easy uh, can be done you know that takes the load off of the people ringing up the phone saying oh, can I have an appointment or I don't know wait a minute let me just check my diary I can only come in every other Thursday etc etc um, And also, uh, the payments are done remotely, you know, so if uh, we book someone in for a checkup next uh, Friday, then we send them an invoice that has to be paid, and they can do it on their mobile phone, has to be paid by next Wednesday, five o'clock. And so, again, all we do is we get a constant stream of emails saying who's paid. And, uh, then we, and when we get a minute, we just sit down in front of the computer and just credit all their accounts and send them out the receipts. And they obviously get a receipt from the online They've got the online payment receipt from Square, but uh, we also send them a receipt just to, uh, which is generated as a consequence of crediting their account. So there's not there's not a ton of phone calls. The phone calls tend to come mainly from new patients, uh, and a lot of them just ringing round to find a dentist. We've had a situation where uh, the NHS has commandeered all the private hospitals um, because they've got such a backlog of work. They've, uh, they've literally stolen <laughs> oh, the, by giving them large amounts of money, I suppose, all the private capacity locally. And so now if you want a, a private operation done, and I do know someone who wants one done, uh, I mean urgently, as in broken their leg, and wants a, a private ankle surgeon, um, they can't get theatre time. And the, you know, I, I don't mind the NHS. Here's the problem I have with this situation. 
the NHS is, is extremely inefficient and, uh, and uh, does things uh, to a very poor standard uh, for the most part, uh, compared to the private sector anyway. And uh, for example, in our local hospital, they're understaffed. And so what they're doing is that they're busing patients to London to um, have stuff done. And this transport runs twice a week and it costs £3,000 every time it runs. So they're paying £6,000 a week to transfer these patients. And for less than that, they could get the staff that they need. <laughs> so they don't need to bust the patients. But they, this is a classic case of the NHS left hand not talking to the right hand and they're not caring at all about the cost because it's not their money it just comes out of the sky so and in, in many cases the worse uh, the worse they are in terms of budgeting the more money they get because the more they can argue that they're they've run out of money the more they come up on the agenda of the committees that give money and, and therefore they get more money. So th there's all sorts of perverse incentives there. So. Now, what, what happens when an NHS hospital takes over the private wing that's associated with it, they all turn into massive dicks. They all, whenever all the people who were had quite happily working outside the NHS find that they can't do it anymore and when they ring up they get through to some NHS ward sister who says no I'm sorry uh, but as of two weeks ago you know the blah blah wing is is now been commandeered by the NHS and you're like well what well, can I get this done can I get that done no 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 so there's literally a fight going on at the moment there between the private consultants who want to book theatre time and the NHS consultants who won't let them and this is bearing in mind, right, that the private consultants are seeing they're the same patients. The private consultants are wanting to treat the patients privately and the NHS consultants are saying, no, uh, we are going to frustrate that ambition and, uh, and not give them the option of going private because we've commandeered all the private facilities. So we're going to be doing everything from now on. And that's the dickishness of it, right? And it comes from a, a conflict of ideology in that the... Now, are you turning left? Yes, you are. Thanks for not indicating. So, what the, um, you know, the, the NHS people will be celebrating that they have removed a large part of the um, privatisation of the National Health Service. They frustrated it. <clears throat> and they uh, very sincerely believe that the NHS will only work if we all use it. Because if rich people don't use the NHS, then it'll become a crap service. Um, they don't understand that if it becomes a crap service for other reasons, then the rich won't use it, which is the actual truth. So, <clears throat> so by, by including uh, all sorts of people who would have opted out to go private in the NHS, they believe that they're strengthening the service. Whereas in fact what they're doing is they're weakening the service. Because someone who would have paid, let's say, £5,000 for an ankle operation privately, and therefore doesn't need the NHS to do that for them, to a lower standard and worse, and probably with several wound infections, and, and an extended stay in bed, um, well, well will be saving resources they'll be they'll be they'll leave behind their resources in the NHS that they would have otherwise taken up and as a result more patients can be treated who, who don't have the option to go private because the NHS budget can be used for patients who don't have the option to to leave and that's the pragmatic reality of it that's not accepted by the NHS and which is why they are such dicks when they get the upper hand and it's it's uh, it's the old broken window fallacy you know that uh, the uh, the idea that uh, if the economy is in the doldrums then 
what you should do, go, go around with a big bag of stones and throw a load of stones through windows. And what will happen is that then um, the economy will pick up because everyone will have to get some work done. You know, I mean, okay, so it obviously mainly be the glaziers, but, uh, you know, the same thing applies, you know, just, just do stuff. Just do stuff, just disturb stuff, spoil stuff, blow stuff up. Um, and, uh, you know, in Ukraine, for example, being the pr present case in point, cause a load of damage and then what happens is the economy picks up because there's going to be a lot of work around. <laughs> well, anyone who knows what the effect of a war is knows that it doesn't actually make the economy pick up except that the, the military industrial complex sells a lot of um, weapons. But the problem is the opportunity cost, you know, supposing I'm sitting there quite happy thinking about buying a new telly and someone puts all my windows out, then um, that, that telly money is going to have to go on repairing the windows, isn't it? So, okay, the windows get repaired and the glaze is happy, but the telly guy is upset because um, I haven't bought a new telly. So you haven't actually created anything. All you've done is just to diverted resources to put in back in restoring the status quo ante you just uh, haven't achieved anything and that's what the NHS needs to understand they're better off letting people go private if they want to and and uh, utilizing their budget squandering their budget I would say on a bunch of stupid things like ambulance transports in the hope that they might be a safety net for at least a few a few people who um, either can't afford to go private or um, you know are ideologically determined to go private <laughs> which we used to have more of those uh, we've sort of got over that a bit in dentistry in the 80s you used to have a lot of people who used to say who used to say well I can do this more quickly for you privately or I can do this to a higher standard for you privately which was true because, I mean, as I've said before, the main difference between the NHS and private is the quality of the uh, laboratory work, the quality of the materials and the time available. Um, and um, and you oh, always to get into some blazing mouths of people who are saying, no, why should I go private? I pay my national insurance. That was their standard phrase. I pay my national insurance. <laughs> A bit like people who shout at, uh, used to shout at train guards like that. Don't talk to me like that. I'm a taxpayer. You work for me. You know, you work for me. I'm your boss. <laughs> and they're like that, you know. I pay my national insurance. You're in, you, I should be entitled to NHS dentistry. To which my attitude was, look, you, first of all, go and shout at your MP. He's the one who set the system up. Or go and shout at the Department of Health. They're the people who get the money and don't provide the service. Don't shout at me, okay? Go and shout at go and shout at someone else. So I don't. You are. In, you may be entitled to NHS treatment, as far as I'm concerned. And if you know that, you know, if that's what you want, and most people who really, really want it don't actually know exactly what it is, uh, then um, then fine. You 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 are entitled to it, but you're not entitled to have it necessarily from me. You know, in those days you weren't. I suppose these days, uh, in the days of sort of, I don't know whether you still, you still, you can still uh, refuse to see a patient on the NHS. I think if you take them on for an NHS exam, I think you then have an obligation to treat them on the NHS. But um, although people have tried all sorts of funny little workarounds by, like doing a free private checkup beforehand and then uh, sussing them out, and if they don't want to go private, then then deciding whether to do an, a chargeable NHS exam uh, and not doing it if uh, you know you, you, you don't want to take the work on because you'd perhaps be doing it at a loss. But there's all these little um, stupid ways around things. Uh, Department of Health doesn't realise that they're uh, they're fighting a losing battle with the profession. The profession can jink around far faster than the Department of Health can find loopholes and oh and even you know bend the rules break the rules who's there they're not going to have a cctv in every surgery do you know what i mean it's not you know 
The dentists control the system. They do control the system. If they choose to work on the NHS, it's because they've chosen to work on the NHS. It's not because the Department of Health has forced them to work on the NHS. And if they choose to go private, then they go private. But just, you know, if you're in the ascendancy as a... If you're in the ascendancy as a... If you're, you're providing a bad service, but by virtue of the fact that you get public money, you're able to take over all the private capacity in the area. Just don't be a dick about it, alright? Just don't be a dick. Alright, nice to talk to you. Talk to you later. Bye.